It should not be a felony to consume these earth medicines. You are so pretty, little baby Get out of the car, now! Why am I being apprehended? You trying to give me a ticket I for your failure? Nearly four years after Sandra Bland died in jail, a cell phone video she recorded of the traffic stop that led to her arrest has been made public. And then you're gonna I will stop light me? you up. Get out! Wow. Get Texas out. officials out. say it was part of the evidence given to Bland's family's lawyer, but he says he's never seen wow. it. Get out of the car! Really for a failure to signal. You're doing all of this for Get a over to there. Bland's sister wants Texas to reopen its case against the state trooper, who was charged with perjury for claiming he feared for his safety. Charges that were dropped in exchange for his agreement to leave law enforcement. Put your phone down right now. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed one of the strictest abortion laws in the country today, making the state the fourth this year to ban abortions once a doctor can detect a fetal heartbeat. That would effectively make it illegal to end a pregnancy after six weeks, before many people know they're pregnant in the first place. Three weeks ago, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan suffered a major embarrassment when an opposition candidate was declared Istanbul's mayor, a seat his ruling AK party controlled for 25 years. Erdogan alleged voter fraud, and now the High Election Commission has agreed, nullifying the win and calling for a redo next month, inspiring a new push from the opposition, which vows to win a second time. If this last year is any indication, I know together we will continue to make a real difference. To celebrate one year of Melania Trump's Be Best initiative, the White House released this video looking back at the many times the First Lady was in the vicinity of children. Be Best may not have achieved anything measurable in the last year, but then again, it is an awareness campaign, though it's technically impossible to fail. Tensions between the White House and congressional Democrats hit a new high yesterday after Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said the IRS would not turn over Donald Trump's tax returns to the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who requested them last month. What's really going on here is simply that Trump doesn't want to let Congress get a look at his taxes. This isn't a one-off. Instead, it's part of a bigger pattern of Trump rejecting congressional oversight of all kinds. In just the past two weeks, the White House instructed former White House counsel Don McGahn to ignore a subpoena from the House Judiciary Committee related to the Mueller report. Trump sued Deutsche Bank and Capital One to stop them from complying with congressional subpoenas of Trump's financial records. The Department of Justice said it would not comply with a congressional subpoena asking a DOJ official to testify about the addition of a citizenship question to the census. And Attorney General William Barr refused to testify to the House Judiciary Committee about the Mueller report because of a dispute over who would question him. Now there's Mnuchin's refusal. Democrats could respond by subpoenaing Trump's tax records, but the administration will likely just refuse to comply, which raises the question of the moment. What can Congress actually do when a president ignores its oversight power and its subpoenas? In theory, Congress isn't powerless. First, it can hold whoever's ignoring the subpoena in contempt of Congress. The House Judiciary Committee, for instance, is going to vote tomorrow on whether to hold Barr in contempt for ignoring a subpoena to turn over the full, unredacted Mueller report. Contempt can be a criminal charge punishable by up to a year in prison. But here's the catch. When Congress holds someone in contempt, they refer the charge to a U.S. attorney for prosecution. U.S. attorneys work for the Department of Justice, which is run by the Attorney General. So in order to enforce criminal contempt against someone ignoring a subpoena, Congress would have to get the Trump administration to agree to investigate and prosecute itself. So strike that off the list. Second, Congress could file a lawsuit to get a judge to order the person to obey the subpoena. But with appeals, that could take a long time, and the administration might also ignore the court's order. There is a direct solution Congress could pursue. It could order a sergeant at arms to track down and arrest recalcitrant Trump officials. They would then be tried by Congress and, if convicted, thrown in the congressional jail until they comply with subpoenas. 
In 1821, the Supreme Court held that Congress has the inherent authority to do this. And in 1927, it upheld Congress's arrest of someone connected to the Teapot Dome scandal. But Congress hasn't arrested anyone since 1935. The congressional jail doesn't actually exist. And if a sergeant at arms did try to drag Steve Mnuchin off to the Hooskow, it would provoke the kind of constitutional crisis that people in Washington generally want to avoid. What that means is that what we're likely to see is what we've been seeing. Congress trying to exercise oversight, the Trump administration dragging its feet in order to run out the clock on these investigations, and the courts periodically stepping in to try to break the impasse. It's an unsatisfying state of affairs, but it's what you get when the executive branch has most of the cards and isn't afraid to play them. Every day in the searing heat, medical student Ramela Salah joins thousands protesting in downtown Khartoum. Demonstrations pushed out a dictator of three decades, Amr al-Bashir. And now they want to get rid of the top generals who replaced him. The daily sit-in across from military headquarters has a carnival atmosphere. When protests started, it wasn't jovial. Security forces fired on the crowd. At least 59 people were killed. Since Bashir was deposed, the military's only kept watch. What if the military doesn't hand over power or takes its time? or show signs that it's not going to be as simple as you'd like it to be. The sit-ins give leverage to a coalition of unions representing civilian interests of the military. Mohammed Naji al Assam was the first in this group to go public with his dissent. He was arrested, held in prison for 98 days, and only released after Bashir was deposed. Now he's one of eight members who negotiate with the military face to face. Do you think that the military will concede to? you telling them to hand over power? We don't have a lot of issues to discuss with them. We have a main issue that the power should go to the civilians immediately. And this issue, uh, it's not a very complicated issue. It's either you accept or you refuse. Their vision for civilian rule includes four years under an interim government that would give them the time to write a new constitution and plan elections. Uh, we toppled al-Bashir and we toppled Ibn Auf in less than 24 hours. And I think if we kept our movement going, we can also pressure the military to handle the to civilians. And if they don't buckle to pressure, you will topple them too? Yeah, that's what we are going to do. But at the moment, it doesn't look like the military is going to hand over power. Their tone has become increasingly hostile. <laughs> 
لا نقبل أي فوضى أو تفرد أو احتداء على المواطنين وامتلكاتهم ومغدرات ومغدرات الدولة وسوف يتم التعامل بالحزم اللازم وفق القانون لا فوضى بعد اليوم لا فوضى بعد اليوم The military does have some support from old guard Islamist parties that have been cut out of negotiations. Ghazi Salah Adin is the leader of one of those parties, Reform Now. The Coalition for Freedom and Change say that they are not going to agree to any situation where the army has any power. Do you think they're taking the right approach? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they need to be flexible. So you think they're being stubborn? Well, stubborn is one way of describing it. So what do you think will happen if both sides don't come to an agreement? In this case, the army would be the, the, the one who can call the shots, which could include uh, a military coup. You think that's a real possibility? It happened before, so it can happen again. This is an unprecedented time in Sudan. People born under Bashir have never experienced free political expression. And it's up to people like Romela to stay on the street to ensure that they get the government they want. Douglas grows hallucinogenic mushrooms in a climate-controlled tent at the foot of his bed. It's like 80 degrees, 82. That's a common temperature for like the fruiting phase. He makes a few thousand dollars a year, selling to a small roster of local clients. Can you see like in these big tubs, there's these little white dots? Yeah, yeah. That's like the beginning of like the pinning process. I'd say it takes like nine days before they start to grow like really tall and they're about ready to be harvested. Right now, none of this is legal. Douglas's real name is not Douglas. A lot of people don't want to take psychedelics because they're scared. It really comes down to like they're afraid of not being in control or of experiencing something that's really common, which is like ego disillusion or ego death. But it is illegal. Illegal to grow, illegal to sell, yes. illegal to possess. Illegal in every way possible. Yeah. So yeah, they'd, they'd come fuck me up. For sure. That's why Douglas would be stoked if Denver passed a ballot initiative, being considered today, that would decriminalize using and possessing mushrooms. Douglas's bedroom operation would still be illegal, but he knows that decriminalizing use is effectively the first step towards broader legalization. Case in point, in 2005, Denver became the first major city in America to decriminalize possession of weed. Colorado fully legalized recreational use seven years later. Our big last weekend to push and contact voters and talk to people and educate people. Kevin Matthews is the campaign manager for Denver's Mushroom Initiative. For the past six months, he's devoted himself full time to the cause. Hey man, vote yes on 301. Are you a Denver voter? Awesome, bro. Thank you. How come you're so invested in this? I mean, do you just happen to really like doing hallucinogenic <laughs> mushrooms? Well, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I love mushrooms. Okay. I'm actually one of those guys that actually likes the taste. They are right. not famed for their not famed flavor. For their no. I like the taste. <laughs> yeah. um, I attribute no longer suffering from major depression to one big experience that I had almost a decade ago using mushrooms. And mushrooms gave me a new perspective. They, they opened my eyes, the fog lifted. The dull gray of my life cleared and 
open up in this, you know, crescendo of panoramic color and, and beauty. And I'm talking this was one use. The benefits lasted weeks and weeks and months afterwards, after one time of using it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I forget what have you guys heard? Psilocybin doesn't have all the advantages of cannabis when it comes to legalization. It's not a household substance in quite the same way, and its effects can be much stronger, even dangerous. What it does have is a very enthusiastic fan base. Hey, would you like a cool piece of art to put on your fridge? Sure. Awesome. <laughs> you gonna vote to decriminalize mushrooms? How often do you take mushrooms? Well, I've, re I've really been into microdosing. Not saying I do that on a daily basis. It's pretty variable. I don't live a very structured or linear life in that sort of way. It should not be a felony to consume these earth medicines. It is a gift from the divine, and it should be freely consumed with little repercussions. In the rest of Denver, today's election is about the campaign for mayor. The Mushroom Initiative has had almost no impact on that race. And while top city officials have all issued statements opposing it, none of them have bothered to do much beyond that. Partly, that's because Denver is used to this kind of thing. But it's also because mushroom arrests just aren't a big political cause. Out of more than 9,000 drug-related prosecutions in Denver in the past two years, only 11 involved psilocybin. Doug Friedash was Denver's city attorney in 2012 when the state voted to legalize recreational pot. My first takeaway is that it's a solution looking for a problem. I don't see us having a problem in the city. If the goal is to decriminalize and not make it a, the highest law enforcement priority, but the lowest, I think it's already there. What really has Fried Nash concerned is that the Mushroom Initiative goes even further than early marijuana laws. It doesn't just decriminalize, it actually bans the city from spending money to prosecute psilocybin-related cases. I think there are going to be some questions about, is this enforceable? And can you actually pass a law that says you can't enforce laws? And I think that's very different than just saying it's the lowest priority. Is there a feeling in the city like, okay, we did marijuana, that was one thing, but now we're gonna do mushrooms and what's next? I think we have the experience from the marijuana ballot issue that shows the sky's not gonna fall if this passes. But at the same time, I, I think what hasn't been vetted here is whether there's reputational risk to the city of Denver by passing this. Are we seen as like this, you know, illicit drug capital of the United States? Are we the Amsterdam, you know, of the West? I think that we could switch the perspective there and say, you know, Denver can be a sanctuary where people can come and not be criminalized for using something that has a demonstrated potential medical benefit. Is this really that necessary? There aren't really that many people who get arrested for you know, magic mushrooms. If there aren't that many arrests in the first place, then why should it be criminalized? Why don't we just decriminalize it then? Because people are, individuals are using it. I think we're moving to this place right now where there's gonna be a, a wave of support for this kind of thing across the entire country. Hi, I'm Moby, and I'm a musician. I'm an activist. I own a restaurant. I write books. I was in an Eminem video, sort of, a long time ago. And I'm bald. So I know conventionally, a vice is something like pornography addiction, smoking crack cocaine with strangers in hotel rooms both of which vices I've had in the past. But now I'm middle-aged and boring and sober, and so my vices are a little more anodyne. 21st century surrealism, for me it's a vice because it's the only art that I collect. And maybe I've spent $100,000 on surrealist art. If I had to self-identify as a new surrealist, I would draw my little alien, ideally on a planet surface somewhere. It's really nice to have a way to leave banal, shitty, at times malignant reality. There's so many things that I love about pine forests. The smell, the sound of wind as it goes through pine needles. If I had to guess how much time I've spent 
looking at, listening to, smelling pine trees. It's in the tens of thousands of hours. You are so pretty, little baby pine cone. Schadenfreude. Loosely translated means shameful joy. Joy at someone's misfortune. And this is the third of my vices and the one that I'm actually ashamed of. So the best schadenfreude is the middle of the winter in Los Angeles. Shitty New York winter weather that makes people very sad. Go. Cab stuck in snow in a blizzard. Idiots. In the course of my life, I've done a lot of drugs. I think I've done just about every class of narcotic that exists. But most of the time it was recreational. The one exception was psilocybin mushrooms. For me, they were remarkably sort of like transformational and educational. Now I'm 53 years old and I'm sober. When I gave up alcohol and drugs, the question is, what do you replace them with? And for me, it's you replace it with everything. You replace it with a combination of like exercise and reading books and being healthy and being an activist and meditating and going to cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not as expedient as alcohol and drugs, but it's a lot more satisfying and it's a lot more long lasting. My parents, before I was born, had decided to name me Richard Melville Hall, which is sort of inspired by the fact that I'm related to Herman Melville, like Richard, Dick, Melville, Herman Melville. When I was born, like most little white babies, I looked like an inbred old Irish bartender. My dad looked at me at this little grub of a baby, and he said, why don't we call him Moby? And that was supposed to be my infant joke nickname. And now 53 years later, I am still called by my infant joke nickname. In the early 2000s, I was out one night with some friends and they were telling me about a game that they had played in college. And the game is called Knob Touch. And it's very simple and I have to make this very clear. It's also completely asexual. You take your penis out of your pants and you walk around a crowded room and seeing how many people you can brush your penis up against. And we were very drunk and I was like, okay. So I pulled my flaccid penis out of my pants and I knob touched Donald Trump. So the only person I've ever knob touched in my entire life is our utterly corrupt current president of the United States. If Donald Trump claims me too because of me, God, I've done my life's work.